What's up, family? Pastor Torrance here. I'm just here to welcome you guys to another Lighthouse service. Hey, worship about to start right now. Let's go. Welcome to another exciting Lighthouse Nation broadcast. We are excited that you decided to join with us in worship and word. Before we get to worship, before we get to word, let's go to God in prayer. The word of God tells us, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. So I declare no matter where you are in this moment, we've made a decision that we're going to exalt the name of the Lord together. Father, we thank you and we praise you now, God. We take on the commandment of your word, God, in all things to give you thanks, Father. Lord, we thank you now, God, trusting and believing, God, that you're releasing an anointing that is destroying yokes and breaking chains, God. Father, we speak, God, to every situation that has crippled your people on today, God, and we loose forth a sound, God. We know that there is deliverance in our sound God there is breakthrough in our sound God there is healing in our sound God so on one accord we release a sound declaring you are God and beside you there is none other God we come together on one accord God releasing a sound God that causes those who are sick to be healed God that causes the broken hearted to be mended God that causes peace to arise in turmoil Father we declare and decree, God, that we would take your word at heart on today, God. And no matter where we are, God, we are the two or three touching and agreeing, God, declaring that you are in our midst, Father. We release a sound that causes deliverance, God. We release a sound that breaks bondage, God. We release a sound that unifies us on today, God. We release a sound that shifts the atmosphere on today. We release a sound and we cry out, Hosanna. Oh God, be glorified in our midst. Oh God, be mighty on today. Do that that only you can do, God. We make room for you on today, God. No matter where we are or what your people are going through, we surrender to you and we say, have your way, oh God. And if you believe it, wherever you are, Say in the name of Jesus, I release a sound that sets me up for my victory. In Jesus' name, amen and bless God. Hallelujah. Father, we worship you. There is none like you in all the earth. We thank you that we stand on a firm foundation and we bless you. Hallelujah. We bless your name. We bless your name, God. Worthy Lamb that was slain, crucified, my debt was paid, Son of God. Praise your name. We praise your name. Sing worthy land. Crucified. My dead was paid. Sing son of God. Emmanuel. We praise. Yeah. Oh. 
His power, a champion forever. All we need and all we want, all we want it's in you, Jesus. It's in you, Jesus. So we cry. chose to come back and we chose to be ready you have come to another tackle the text and I'm telling you I am excited about this panel and I am excited about this text but more importantly I'm excited about your breakthrough because I believe that God is going to use this panel today to set you free and on course for the rest of your life and right in the middle of your destiny listen to my right I have Jason Bowie next to him. I got Rose Ross. I call him Lawrence. And next to him, I've got Brother Brandon Adams, and they all serve in different capacities at all of our ministries and locations. Welcome to the stage, gentlemen. Thank you. You guys doing good. Listen, man, I'm so excited about this text. Uh, now, I'm, I'm used to having you up here, Brandon, because, you know, I'm accustomed to that. Jason, I'm, I'm used to that. But they got Lawrence up here. And let me tell you something about Lawrence. He's quiet. So you don't know that he's got all of that fire down inside of him. But you are about to find out today. Guys, let's get started. Let's get started. I'm excited about this text. So this is Deuteronomy. This is uh, the precipice of Moses transitioning his leadership to Joshua. Because how do I know that? <laughs> Moses says, listen, y'all, can I just put it in, in our mama word? I'm tired. 
Moses says, I'm 120 years old, and ain't nobody got time for that. He says, listen, and here he says, I no longer have the energy to go out and come in. You know, when I read that, I never considered what going out and coming in will do to you. That we're always excited when God brings us out. And we're always discouraged sometimes. I shouldn't say always. And we're mostly discouraged when we go in. But do we ever consider the wear and tear it does on the body, the mind, and the spirit to keep going out and coming in? Going out and coming in. And he says, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so old. I'm so over it that I no longer, no more can I go out and come in. No more can I, can I study like I used to study. No more can I make the income that I used to make. No more, uh, I don't even have the capacity to love the way I used to love. I don't, I don't have the going and the coming the way I used to. And, and Moses says, I'm 120. I'm 120 years old, and, 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 I'm, 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 and I'm getting older. And it almost sounded like his, it was his birthday because he said, this day, I'm, I'm 120. And he says, the Lord has told me, and he told me to tell you that you shall not go over this Jordan. And then he says, the Lord thy God will go over before thee, and he will destroy the nations. I, I want to know, I know what I thought, and I want to hold my thought for a little bit later, but Brandon, I want to know what you thought when you read this text. What jumped, out you, what jumped out at you originally when you laid your eyes on Deuteronomy chapter 31? So uh, the first thing, when I was reading Deuteronomy 31, uh, verse 7, when it says that then Moses called Joshua. Yes. Then Moses called Joshua. What stood out to me was that you have to understand and know who you're around or who's in your circle and are you calling the right person? Oh, yes. Because in the, in the previous chapter, it talked about the choice of life and death. Yes. So when, when Moses called Joshua, what God was saying was, being careful with who you choose determines whether or not you're going to inherit life or inherit death in the fulfillment of the promise. Love it. So that's what captivated me in Deuteronomy 31 and, and verse 7. I couldn't get past the first four words. So I'm, I'm, I'm intrinsically intrigued by that thought process because God obviously created Joshua for this purpose. But Moses had to call him. Moses had to call him. Moses had to recognize that out of the millions of Israelites, that Joshua was in fact the best choice. What was it about Joshua that made Moses look past everybody else and say, yeah, I, I hear you. I hear you, Caleb. I, I hear you, Jason. I hear you, but it's it's going to be, it's going to be Joshua. And I want to unpack that because typically, most frustration is a result of us not being somebody's choice. Okay, let's applaud. It was Joshua. But how do you follow? How do you respond? when you are not somebody's choice. And, and I know the traditional route in this text is to shout about being the choice, but this world is full of seven billion people. And most of them are not CEOs of companies. Most of the people who are watching us right now were looked over for some sort of promotion. Some of them looking right now have been divorced and and have lost loved ones. So can we just spend the first moment of our discussion talking to the people who are not Joshua. To the people who are not chosen. Lawrence, you are a background guy. You don't ever want to be on the stage. You don't ever want to be out front. 
If we were going to pick, you would, you would, you would push other people to be picked before you. And yet somehow you ended up right here. Can you talk to the people of God about how you can be looked over or rather not be picked and still end up in the center seat? Well, it's all about your service. Hmm. You have to serve in season, out of season, and sometimes you have to wait till it is your Joshua moment. Hmm. A lot of times people say, well, why you serve so hard? Because it's not for me. It's all for the glorification of God. So my season is going to come eventually. And for me, I like to hide in the back because I found out when you're quiet in the back, God shines on you a little bit better than the people that want to be in the front. Oh, <laughs> the people that want to be in the front get exposed of the lack of knowledge mm. and a lack of what they don't have. But if you sit in the back and pay attention to everything where your numbers call, God will, everything that you have been watching and he's putting you, he'll give you that wisdom to stand up in front when you need it. So I don't mind sitting in the back. It's okay. It's, it's, it's safety in the back. But when God says it's time for you to go, you have to stand up in your gifting and do what's best for the glorification of him. And then you always have to remember that it's all about him. So if you go and do something and you think that you fail, somebody is saying, well, I see the God in him, so it's okay. So like last week, I thought I, I, thought I dropped it on uh, the day of prayer. However, somebody called and said, you know what, that was meant just for me because I did it for God and not for myself. Yes, sir. And you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just so excited to hear you say that because it brought two things to mind. Number one, some people preach their way to the stage. Some people sing their way to the stage. Some people politic their way to the stage. But you just showed the world there's a different route. And it's called serving your way to it. And you serve. I, I could tell you guys there are days that Lawrence is with me at another church or, or before I preach or, or, or serving. And, and he sits in the back. He never invites himself into a room I'm invited to. He, he'll drive the car and stay outside if he needs to. He just serves and he serves and he serves. And now you're, you're up here on the stage as a servant, not as a preacher. But as a servant, not as a minstrel, but as a servant, not as a singer, but as a servant. And you served your way at the top. But you just said something to me that made me want to ask you to go deeper. You said there's safety in the back. There's safety in the back. And, and see, that's true because when, when Saul was looking for David, the Bible says that he hid his wife and children in the back of the camp. Because there is safety in the back of it. What, what, what made you realize? Because some people think that the safety is out front. But, but that's the first person who takes the bullet. That's the, when you are uh, the, the discoverer of a nation or, or a movement, you had to take the scars first. W when did you discover that there was safety in the rear? Well, my dad was a pastor. So ah. being able to sit and watch him do certain things. I understood the, the, the grind of service or the grind of ministry. So I've always stepped back and to watch him and to protect him to see that everything that's coming. When you're in the front, you only see the front of the line. But when you're in the back, you can see what's behind the front of the line. So I can whisper in his ear, hey, Pop, you might don't want to go in that direction. You might want to go in this direction. Even here, I sit in the back. So when I see stuff happening, I can warn the people that I'm in uh, – I can protect, and it's, it's protective. So I like to sit in the back because I get to see everything, and nobody sees me. And you know what? I, I just thought about the fact that you are up here ministering today, and you served all day. He served. He, he has on what he had on when he was serving. He was standing at the door when I came in. He texted me and said, what time are you getting here? I said, I'll be there. I said, I'm pulling up right now. Uh, I got here a little earlier than normal today. He was right outside, walking outside. He served. He came. What do you want to eat? Asked me what my menu was. Came out there, got my shoes, got my clothes, did all of that, and then came up here to serve you. See, that's, that it, it's, have you ever seen the kind of person that on the day their number is called, they have to stop doing the thing that got them called up? So it's important, what I'm saying, is that on your day, when your number is called, that does not mean that you get to be called away from the thing that got you called to this place. That on the day that you are called to be king, David, you still have to go out to the field and tend the sheep because just because you have a castle doesn't mean you have to get rid of your responsibilities and you have to be able to balance the polarities of being a servant of God and being able to do what you are called to 
at the same time that you are able to do what you were called from. Jason, you are, you are you're like one of those jack of all trades. You're liable to be preaching at 3 o'clock, singing at 3.15, shooting a video. The other, the other weekend, you did my sister's wedding. I've never seen the photographer dance with the camera on the dance floor. I've never seen anything like that. You, you have a tendency to be everywhere at the same time, and you give everything the same amount of energy. But what most people don't know is that before this stretch in your life, before you were hired by your ministry, before your business took off, just two or three years ago, you didn't know how you were going to feed your family. You had been looked over for position after position, lost a job. How did you end up here? Because you were not Joshua a year ago. You were not Joshua two years ago. Help the people who are not Moses' initial pick. What do you do until it's your time? You got to look at your leader in front of you. Um, I feel like when I looked at this scripture, I was more drawn to understanding the pain of disobedience. Moses was chosen to take them to the promised land, but yet he got told, you ain't crossing this Jordan. Mm -hmm. And so when you talked about Moses and Joshua's wow. shadows and types, Moses is kind of like the reflection of Adam's disobedience. Joshua is, is, is the combination of Jesus fulfilling the promise, in a sense. You get what I'm saying? Yes. And so when you look at it, you say, okay, the pain of disobedience, everything I went through was because of the pain of my disobedience. Mm. It wasn't until I started being obedient that I started seeing the fullness of God's blessings. Awesome. And so he's, when I looked at it, um, I believe the scripture is in Jude. He was just saying, L keep loving God in everything that you do. So me being obedient is not just fulfilling his commandments. It's saying, I love you so much that my trust is only found in you. So when I look for my light bill to be paid, I know it's coming from you. When I look for the car to be repaired, it's coming from you. When I look for the promotion, it's coming from you. Man doesn't dictate how I should be obedient or disobedient. Mm. And so I looked at the pain and I, and I could connect with the pain of rejection. And I realized it wasn't a rejection of man, it was a rejection of me to God. That's awesome, man. You know, because David could have felt rejected. He could have felt rejected. I mean, think about this. He had the oil poured on him by the prophet. Samuel gave him the oil and then sent him back to the field. And, and sometimes your anointing doesn't match your situation. Sometimes you can have a high anointing and a low position. And you have to wait on those two things to catch up. And, and I think, this is me. Now let's get into the text because I think that this is perhaps one of the few times that we see a bad leadership moment for Moses. Because Moses comes to the people and says, listen, here we go. I know that we are supposed to possess the land, but thou shalt not go over into the Jordan. You're not going. Can you imagine that announcement, what they're thinking? Oh, my God. God, why us now? Here we go again. But Moses didn't say, you're not going to the Jordan because I in a moment of rage, disobeyed God and struck the rock when I was supposed to speak to it. And I think that one of the signs of bad leadership is making the people feel like it was their problem, that they were not going into the promised land when really they were not able to go into the promised land with him because they eventually did cross over the Jordan. And now let's get into this because sometimes God calls us to be transitional leaders that he causes us to stand in between our insecurities and somebody else's failure. And when you stand in between somebody's failure and your insecurity and you're called to lead people into a place, number one, that they don't deserve to go, and number two, you don't even know where to go, and now God calls you to do this new thing, Joshua is getting ready to experience something in a few days that he had no idea that was coming. As soon as the book of Joshua starts, here's what the Bible says. Joshua, Moses, my servant, is dead. He goes from being old to dead. And now it is Joshua's turn to lead while he bleeds. And it is his turn 
to lead people into the promised land when his heart is broken. Brandon, have you ever been in a situation where you were called to do a job while life was doing a job on you? Where you were hurting, but you had to still lead. Where you were frustrated, but God still say go forward. I want you to talk to the people of God about what is possible and how do you keep your hand to the plow without looking back. When Moses has died and the Canaanites are in front of you and the Jordan River is there waiting to swallow you up, how do you keep going forward in spite of all of those odds? You keep going forward by looking at the vision that God had told you years before. So before I even came to the lighthouse, I was broke. When I started coming here, I only had 46 cents in my pocket. Good God. And, of course, fast forward and now, that ain't the case. That ain't the issue. Our business is due over six figures. But when I came here, I didn't come to be seen. I didn't come to be heard. Like Lawrence, I just came to be seated in the back. I just came to get filled from a season that I just came out of. So in being in that position, in that place, what I realized is when you're serving and when you commit to serving, even if you don't get noticed, the purity of your heart, God can trust. Mm -hmm. And so if he can trust the purity of your heart, he can elevate you to places where you never thought you could go. So he's, he's testing you in those moments, in those seasons. He's testing you to see, will what I, with, with what you have, are you going to come out as pure gold or are you going to come out as fool's gold? <laughs> None but the pure in heart shall see him. Yes. Yeah. Listen, the second half of today, you don't want to miss. I want to pause right now to tell you that I promise you that there is a moment coming that you're going to want to sow into. Now, typically, it's easy to sow into those moments after those moments have happened. That's called emotionalism. Right now, I'm going to ask you to give by faith. There is a moment coming that I want you to sow into. There is a message coming that I want you to sow into. And I'm asking God to give you what you are about to hear. I'm not going to give it away. I want you to plant the seed before you see the forest. I want you to get your best gift right now. And I want you to make sure that you plant this seed in the ground for the future of yourself and everybody and everything that you love. I promise you that there was a rhema word on the other side of this break. Get your gift now. There is a message coming up on the screen. It'll show you exactly all of the ways that you can give. And to all of our Lighthouse 2.0 members, I want to thank you so much for making us your church, even though you've never been in this building. We love you and may God bless you. Check out the second half of this message. You know, it, it's amazing, and I don't even know if we knew we were doing this intentionally. I met all three of y'all through service. Mm -hmm. yes, sir. None of y'all came here preaching or singing. I met all of y'all. I remember I met Brandon off a pair of sunglasses, and he had a business partner, and they gifted me a pair of sunglasses that right now, I promise you, if you go in my car, they are the only pairs. I got them in my car right now. Every time I'm driving and the sun starts, same glasses you gave me years ago, I put them on. I never change them out because I'm a, I'm a sentimental value type of person. They mean something to me. I still have them there. I've taken them all around the world with me. We met with him serving. I met you, Lawrence, through service. Jason, you came here. I met you when we were, when we were in our late 20s through service. Every one of you all have served your way here. Your perspective is, listen, I've had Moses to die, and I've had a hard river in front of me, but I kept my heart pure. So if I were taking notes and you were listening to me today, I would understand that, that the purity of your heart can make all of the difference in who chooses you. Yes, sir. It is not your gift. It is not how you look. I, can, I hear somebody right now, thank you, Holy Spirit, you're looking for a spouse, and, and you're getting your hair done or your hair cut, and, and you're getting dressed up, and you're going out every night trying to be put in the right places so you can be seen by somebody, and God says you're working on the wrong thing. Don't work on your eyes. Don't work on your heart. 
I mean, excuse me, your hair. Don't work on your clothes. I want you to work on your heart because the right person sees your heart before they see your hair. The right person sees how you feel before they see what you say. It is the heart matter. God chose David off of heart. I hear the Holy Spirit saying that your next promotion and your next season will be at the same level as your heart. If you are low in heart, you will be low in position. If you are high in heart, you will be high in position, which means that some of us got to do some heart work. And heart work is hard work. Did you hear what I said? Heart work is hard work. Do you know how hard? Yes, you do, because you've been through it. It is hard work not letting things and people get to your heart. It is hard, hard work to make sure that disappointment, all of you all coming from the back could have been disappointed by the fact that you didn't get to the front fast, that it took each and every one of you years to get to the front. And Lawrence, I need you to speak to somebody because somebody's saying he can say what he wants. He up there. I've been serving, but nobody saw me. I stood in the back. I kept my mouth quiet. I was, I was loyal and nobody saw me. What do you say to the person who wants it before God releases it? Well, well, first of all, you have to understand that when it's time to serve, you have to serve. My first serving here was moving the podium. I thought that was, I had the best job in the business. Because <laughs> if I didn't move the podium, you couldn't preach. And I enjoyed that. I didn't want to do anything else. And then when I got my calling, I beg not to sit on the front. I want to sit on the side. So you just have to be humble in everything that you do. You have to thank God for the opportunities that he gives you every moment and every day. Just being in the church house to me was great because when I got here, I was broken. I had gave up on a lot of stuff when it came to church. But the fact that I wanted to sit in the back and God pushed me to the front is because of my heart because I didn't want it till this day. Pastor Torrance to say, hey, 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 Reverend, you up? And I'd be like, no, I, I'm not up. <laughs> I'm not up. However, he does that because I've never tried to push to the front. So he sees my heart. Y'all see my heart. Y'all understand that I do this because of the love of God and not because of the love of the lights. That's amazing. Listen, hold on. First of all, both are light. The Lord is my light. light. And my it's just which light? It's which light you choose to be on because one is a blinding light. But one is, is like a black light. One will blind you on the road to Damascus. But the other one will blind your enemies from seeing where you are. One light, one light exposes, but one light covers. So you stand on the stage, these lights show a uh, uh, crooked mustache, shiny forehead, but then the other light, he covers you in his secret place. And the reason why you're up here is because you picked the right light. You picked the right light. You picked the, he, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? He's the strength. Whom shall I? When evil men come up on me to eat my flesh, they stumble and fail. And though a host shall encamp around me, and this will I be confident. See, this is a, this is a Psalms 27 moment. That the reason why Joshua was picked by Moses is because he was under the right light. Had he been, had he been trying to get to the front, maybe he would have been left in the back. But he was, just, he was just supporting. He was just supporting Moses. Okay, Moses, you said let's go, let's go. Moses, I know that was wrong, but I'm not going to complain. Moses, I know you. I'm, I'm here for you. And Lawrence, you were Pastor Torrance's armor bearer. You served my assistant who then did one of the most miraculous things I've ever seen in ministry. Said, Reverend, he's so good, he needs to serve you. I've never, in all of my life of ministry, seen somebody who was being served by somebody who was exemplary pass that person on to their leader because they felt that their leader needed another level of service. That's how you become Joshua. 
That's how you become Joshua, recognizing that it is not about you and it is not about what you bring to the table, but it's about being invited to the table. I want to talk to somebody who, who wants to impress you by the fact that they have something to bring to the table. It's not about what you have that brings you to the table. It's about who you are that gets you invited to the table because, listen, if God wants you at the table, you can be a Judas and still get an invite. It doesn't matter what you have to bring to the table. All that matters is that you're available for God to invite you to the table. You're at the table, Jason. Everywhere I go, I see you. I can't, I can't go to the studio without seeing you there. I can't go to this place and not see you there. Now I'm starting to see the Jason that I knew. Foreknew. I told you this. A decade ago, I saw you here a decade ago, but you did not see yourself there. What do you say to people who don't see who they are? How do you survive until you see it? I'm about to have a Pastor Raymond moment. Well, that means we're about to all get enlightened with the Holy Ghost and the, <laughs> and the theological word. No, as they were talking, because it's, 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 it's the culmination. I never wanted to come to the front. I left my grandfather church and was like, cool, I'm cool with being in the back of the church. But as you talked about getting to that progression and, and, and God calling you up, you can either have your heart attacked or your heart attached. Ooh. The pain of your disobedience brings the heart attack. The pain of obedience brings your heart attached. See, as even if you reprimanded me, my heart was connected to you, so I couldn't even be mad at you. I was happy you was even talking. I'd rather you fuss at me than not talk to me. And I, I feel like that's how we are with Christ. And God, God, you can reprimand me all day as long as you don't disconnect from me. And so when I realized that it was better to be attached to something, even if I had to mop, I was still connected because everybody get a ring when we win a win championship. And so, you, you, you just brought tears to my eyes because those whom he loves, he also, chastens. He also chastens. Yes. I, I never, and I did not get emotional, I never chastened you because I was upset. I chastened you because I knew who you were. I knew what you could become. I knew what God gave me, because like any good father, he pays attention to his children, and he knows their ways. He knows what God has for them, and I saw, I, I knew that one day you had the ability to live in a house debt-free, and now you have a house with no mortgage in an era where people are losing their homes, huh? Now you have a thriving business when just a few years ago you were being fired from a job and not appreciate it. Trying to search and find the next big thing. And all I was saying was, settle down because you're next. You don't have to be anybody you were not called to be. I knew who you were. My job was to tell you what Moses told the children of Israel. He says, you don't have to be worried about going over. And don't be mad because God said you will not cross over the Jordan now. Because if you're in the flesh, you're going to be upset with God because he says not now. But what you don't know about not now is he is going before you taking care of the nations and making sure that you can walk into your season and not have to fight when you get there. On dry ground. He was making sure that the, the, the Hittites and, and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Jebusites and the seven nations for Deuteronomy chapter 3. That by the way the Bible says was stronger than them. He was making sure that they were trapped in waters and trapped by their enemies. And making sure that when the children of Israel got to Canaan, they didn't have to worry about Mookie and, 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 and Junebug, but they could worry about milk and honey. Yes, sir. Yeah. 
And sometimes God delays you because it takes him a couple of days to deal with your enemies. Sometimes he leaves you in the grave, but there's a resurrection coming. Sometimes God says not yet because if you get under that light, it will expose what you haven't learned yet. Sometimes he says hold on and he holds you back. And what you need to understand is the only reason why I ever held any of you all back is because I looked at you like an arrow and God said I was the bow. And the reason why I pulled you back is to shoot you forward. And had I not held you back, you would not have a business that was multiple six figures. And you would not be on this stage right now with your own brand on your chest. And you would not have your own business. It might have looked like I was holding you back, but I was shooting you forward. And every one of you all are in a place you were not when I met you. Every one of you, you are further than you were when I met you, and I know it felt like fussing, and I know you were upset, and I know you were angry, and I know you were saying when, but when I've been tried by the fire, I shall come forth as pure gold, and now you got something to show for it. Yes, sir. You could have been fool's gold, but now you're real gold. Yes, sir. And as a father, I understood what I was doing to each and every one of you. And I didn't release you a moment too late and not a moment too soon. Because now you're up here and you can handle it. All three of your marriages are solid. All of y'all got your own businesses. Every one of y'all are driving better than you were when I met you. And the only reason why I did it to you is because it was first done to me. I told you the story about what Bishop Jakes did to me. How he held me back. I don't have to tell that story again. It was good. And I'm proud of every one of you. I don't even know where this, this, this attack of the text are. Is this a, a testimony service? But you, you were Joshua when I met you. But you don't give Joshua his turn out of season. When you say that, Pastor, a lot of people use the term or the phrase delayed, not denied. And I was just telling my niece yesterday at a track event, delayed doesn't mean denial, but delayed also means development. (sighs) Say that again. (laughs) Delayed doesn't mean denial. Delayed just means development. Because in that denial that you think you got, God is just saying, I'm not denying what you want. I'm not denying where you're going. I'm just trying to complete your development so that way when you get there, you can operate how I expect you to. Okay, that's, that's in our text. Yes, sir. That's in our text. Everybody, when you read verse 6, after he commands him, this is what he says. Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God he said again, <laughs> they, they said it in the audience right now. And then verse 7 says, And Moses called unto Joshua and said unto him in the sight of Israel, Be strong and of good courage. The reason why he couldn't tell him that earlier is because he knew he wouldn't have been strong enough. You don't give your child the keys to your car until they're competent. Yes, sir. Not just because they're old enough. It's not about your age, it's about your stage. Are you strong enough to handle what comes with release? Are you ready mentally from 46 cents to multiple six figures? Because if I didn't work on your mind, I promise you, water always finds its lowest level. If I didn't work on your mindset, you would have went from six figures back down to 46 cents because where... Your mind is, there will you be also. As a man thinks, so is he. It takes courage to wait until it's your turn. Do you know how many people came after you and left before you? Do you know how many people, ministers just like you, came here after you had been here already, didn't get it, and left before you got it, and now you're here? Because they came seeking to shine and not seeking to serve. You talk about it. 
So what do you do? What do you say, Jason? What do you say, Lawrence? I want you all to go individually. What do you say? And I, this is so riveting to me. I don't know if it helped anybody. It definitely helped me. I know I got passionate, but you all just brought three to 10 years of churning that we've had together. And you all brought it to a head. And, I, and, and now I'm sitting up here like a proud father, like I, I told you, I saw it. I knew it. I knew it was going to happen. But everybody's journey isn't the same. And there's somebody out there right now, their Joshua and their Moses doesn't see them yet. And they've been serving. Oh, yeah, they've been serving. And they've been giving. They've been showing up. But they haven't gotten a mantle. Jason, Lawrence, Brandon, in that order, your final words. What do you say to people who are in between waiting and falling completely apart. Waiting on the Lord, but upset with Moses. What's your advice for him? Keep waiting. Everything that we've gotten was only a day away. You can't get so caught up that what's not happening today. You don't know that tomorrow might be that day. But if you die, you'll never get there. <laughs> So you got to keep waiting. And you always talked about not waiting like, it's my turn yet? No, how may I serve you? And it's, it's funny, looking at us, us three, I don't think none of us came here called or had answered it. And so we felt comfortable answering a call to a leader that could see us in spite of our immaturity and our lack of preparation or understanding. And so I was, you just got to wait. You got to serve your way to the top. That's, that's the only way you can do You got to serve your way to Ain't nobody passing you up I could be like Look at Raymond Look at him They wasn't here But they waited somewhere else Whew. Hold on I didn't want to interrupt <laughs> But you mean to tell me See Guys did, That is so powerful <laughs> Raymond did you hear what he just said Torrance Pastor Hammond I hope he said it loud enough That y'all heard that In New York California, Jamaica, wherever you are. Because sometimes you show up to a place and you see a person get something. You think, I was here when they got here. But you haven't given that person credit for where they waited before you showed up. When I got to Houston, People that say, oh, he came here and he blew up. They didn't see me in Fort Wayne, Indiana. They didn't see me. In a daycare center, I used to have to pick up the dirty diapers because the deal with the daycare center was if I was going to use it, I had to clean it because I couldn't afford to pay for it. And I picked up dirty diapers and mopped the floor and had to wash all of the dishes that they had fed the kids with in the cafeteria. 75 kids had to wash the dishes and clean up the diapers and clean up the bathrooms in exchange for using this building for two hours on a Sunday. They didn't see me in an office that they gave me with no air conditioning with one chair and a TV tray for a desk with no heat in the room. They didn't see me driving a car that I had to pray would start in the morning before I got to church. And there was a guy named Rob Ryder, I will never forget him, a Caucasian gentleman who loved me and saw me play basketball. He had a, a genuine Christ-like love for a brother. He gave me one microphone 
one cord and two wedges for two hundred dollars a month. Two hundred a month just to have sound in that daycare center. Problem was I didn't have two hundred. So he would charge me two hundred and then give me two hundred. So no, I did not just show up here. And it happened. I waited somewhere else. I struggled somewhere else. And then I struggled when I got here some more. I didn't mean to do that. Lawrence, what do you say to somebody who's in between Jordan and choice? I would say continue to serve because God has already ordained you to be who you are. So you don't have to worry about somebody telling you who you are. He's going to shine that light on you. But you got to continue to serve humbly in those moments. Because if you don't, you'll forfeit your promise. Mm. Trying to find or try to get gratification for something that you already are. So continue to do what you do. I've seen a lot of people want to be up front or saying, I'm, a, I'm this and I'm that. And they forfeit the promise that God had for them because they was doing it for self and not for him. So continue to do what you're supposed to do with the right heart and mindset. And God will go ahead and let somebody say, hey, you are this person in the kingdom, but you're already that person. That person is there for your confirmation. Hallelujah. Brandon, your last word, you got it. What, what do you do when it's your time, but it ain't your turn? You just, you're just waiting on Moses to give you the go ahead. What, Joshua, what do you do until it's your Deuteronomy 31 moment? Um, I would say don't get impatient in the process, but get prepared for power and purpose. I love it. Because when you prepare for your moment, even though it may take longer, what God is depositing in you is power, more power, more power, more power. So that way when you stand wherever you're going to stand in, whether it be on a stage, whether it be uh, in a conference room, whether it be somewhere, it doesn't matter. You're getting prepared for what God needs on the inside of you to reach other people. And if you're not prepared for what God is getting ready, where God is getting ready to take you, then you can't exert power to whoever he needs you to get it to. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. I love the ministry God has given us. Since we've reconstructed this building, I've gotten so many nice messages from people saying, I love the new building and when is the Dream Center going to be done? And I love what's going on in Southwest and Central. And I appreciated all of those compliments, but I am acutely aware that Lighthouse Church didn't make me. I was made when I had five members. That's what made me. I was made when I used to have to walk to church to preach and I had one blue and black jacket with a white shirt and black pants and two ties and I would change the tie up to make it look like a different suit. That's what made me. The fact that on an Easter Sunday, I was full if we had 25 people. And we didn't have air conditioning. And we didn't have heat. One time the pipe broke in the building and I showed up on a Saturday to get ready to clean it for Sunday. And it was eight feet of water in the basement. So much water that it had come up through the second floor and the carpet was wet from the water downstairs. And with water hoses and a company and fans, and by that time, those days you used to have fans, box fans that you would put in the window to draw in air to keep it from being so hot. We used those fans to dry the carpet. We had service on top of seven feet of water because we only was able to drain out a feet, a foot of it 
overnight, and we worshiped. I ain't know no better back then. We worshiped with seven feet of water. I remember looking at the steps thinking I could literally jump off these steps and dive head first into the basement. That's what made me. And then I got to Houston and thought I made it, only to be afflicted again. But I stand here today with a, an acute realization that the most critical lesson you can learn while you wait is to never become bitter in the process. Because you do not want to be called up, but your heart is still down. I told you, he's never going to call you higher than the level of your heart. Keep your heart clean. This is Tackle the Text. Went a different way, but I hope it showed you the way. God bless you. We love you. See you next time. Hey, what's up, family? Listen, I enjoyed the word today. I know you did as well. Hey, if you want to take part in what we're doing here, we have some numbers going to come across the screen. If you want to give to us, hit the number on the screen. If you want to join, be a part of what we're doing here, hit the number on the screen. And remember, share, send this message to someone. Someone needs to hear it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we just want to say thank you just for the word that was given. We pray that someone's heart was touched and someone's mind was changed. We love you, God. All these blessings we ask in your son, Jesus' name, amen. Hey, remember, we love you here at the Lighthouse Church. Nothing you can do about it. See you soon. Hey, everybody. What's going on? It's PK here. And listen, I want to tell you that I get so many DMs, so many messages of people saying, Pastor, how can I connect with you? I love your messages, but going through YouTube is kind of difficult. Where can I come to a centralized place? We heard you. And that's why we created Lighthouse 2.0. Lighthouse 2.0 is our tribe. It's our village. It's the place where all of the people who say, I want PK to be my online pastor. And PK says, I want you to be my online member. This is the place where we go, the watering hole, the ecosystem, where we all come to grow together. And it is exclusively for you. They're getting ready to put a link up on the screen right now that shows you how you make that exclusive step. And everybody can't get in. So you better take first mover's advantage and get in while you can fit in. I can't wait to see you inside of 2.0. May God bless you. And let's do this thing for Christ.